Hi, welcome to Prairie Turnip Farm. We are Hank and Joanna Will. We live on 175 acres in rural Osage County, Kansas. We raise heritage and land raised sheep, cattle and chickens, honeybees, and we also look after a number of donkeys, livestock guardian dogs, ducks, geese, guineas, barn cats, and one stray mule that found her way to the farm and decided to stay on. We maintain abundant habitat to sustain hardy populations of wild pollinators, birds, beneficial insects, reptiles, amphibians, and prairie mammals while raising food for ourselves and our community. Increasing biodiversity is a key aim on the farm, and we work to achieve this outcome at all levels and scales, from allowing pollinator-friendly weeds to grow with abandon in our lawn, to raising livestock in a manner that promotes diversity and resilience, to managing our prairie pastures and meadows for a broad diversity of native grasses and forbs that are supported by a vast array of microbial action below the ground. We are firm believers in the extraordinary gifts that come from the ability to grow one's own food, and we have dedicated ourselves both here on the farm and in our off-farm professional lives to making access to healthy locally grown food a reality for as many people as possible. We are grateful and humbled to be able to provide healthy food raised without the use of chemicals or synthetic additives of any kind for ourselves and our family, our friends, and our community. Our primary livestock focus at Prairie Turnip Farm is our land race sheep. For about 13 years, we've been working on developing a land race hair sheep that will perform under our conditions and our management strategy. They're combinations of Dorper, Katahdin, Corsican, and Barbados Blackbelly to create a breed that's genetically resistant to parasites and that can perform from start to finish on forage. Our animals receive no grain. They receive no antibiotics or other medical treatments in order to make it through the year, and it required some heavy selecting, actually some severe selecting at the beginning, but 12 years or 13 years down the road, and we've got a flock that performs really well under our conditions and our management strategy. The sheep do a couple of things for us. They obviously help with some weed control and all of that, but they also help us to manage the pasture land and the prairie land for greatest diversity. And we do that through our own version of rotational grazing where the animals are on individual paddocks for a specific amount of time and then they move on and they won't revisit the paddock for maybe 20 to 30 days or possibly longer depending on the season so the paddock has a chance to recover. And one of the things that we've noticed is that we can actually modify in a beneficial way the distribution and the diversity of plants in the paddocks by the timing of the grazing episodes. Raising sheep on the Kansas prairie goes hand in hand with intense predator pressure in the form of coyotes. We have worked hard in recent years to decrease the high incidence of lamb and ewe loss to coyotes by adding livestock guardian dogs to our flock. Starting with one large male Great Pyrenees four years ago, we quickly fell in love with livestock guardian dogs and also realized that we would need more of them and a few fencing improvements if we were going to significantly cut our losses. We then added two Great Pyrenees Anatolian Shepherd mix females and bred them to Rupert, our large male dog, and spent last winter raising 16 livestock guardian puppies together with this year's crop of lambs. It was an exciting and interesting time watching the puppies develop with the sheep. Ten of the pups went to close family and friends, and we kept the other six to round out our sheep protection detail. We have suffered no loss to coyotes this year and have the added bonus of having a band of beautiful, intelligent dogs to enrich our lives and the farm. We also maintain a, a small uh, herd of cattle here on the farm. Um, you know, it's in part because I like cattle and it's in part because cattle will do different things uh, in the pasture. They'll eat different things and they'll, uh, you know, help us to change the matrix in a different way than the sheep do. And so, you know, I started out with uh, years and years ago with black Angus cattle. I had a fairly large herd, which I sold. Uh, it was registered and I got tired of all the details of keeping track of a registered herd. And here, uh, because I thought they were cool, I brought uh, a small group of Scottish Highland uh, cattle in 
this is again probably 12 or 13 years ago when I first got here and uh, you know they performed okay for us here I think they're uh, they can get a little bit of uh, heat stress in the summertime but not too bad um, one of the things that's really good about them is that they're, they also do browse so they help a little bit with maintaining their wooded areas and uh, they'll do a little bit of you know broadly weed control like they really do like uh, poison ivy for example um, but uh, you know, our, our, my, my last uh, Highland Bull, our last Highland Bull uh, passed away and we replaced him instead of with another Highland, a uh, Piney Woods Bull, uh, which is, uh, you know, a breed that's a lot more uh, heat tolerant than the, the Scottish Highlanders are. And so we're just now getting our first crop of calves and the calves look great. Uh, we'll be interested to see if they're still genetically lean and tender and finish out on grass just as well as the Scottish Highlanders do. So that's kind of where we're headed with that. The animals are there. Yeah, there's a little bit of um, uh, cash that flows from raising them, but they're really here to help us maintain diversity and, and modify the pasture and the, the meadow matrix. You know, we also keep bees. Uh, Joanna's been a beekeeper for probably 20 years or so, maybe maybe more. Um, and she was trained and and exper highly experienced in using the uh, Langstroth model hives. Uh, and I've only dabbled in that uh, over the years. We bought lots of bee packages and lost lots of bee packages uh, to various environmental factors or just absconding. Uh, it's kind of discouraging in a way, but we also noticed that that, that we had tons of, of uh, what I would call feral bees uh, that you know pollinated our stuff, and uh, you know just sort of log that in our brains. I'm I'm a trained geneticist, and Joanne and I have always talked about how you know we would never bring sheep here from some place that's really far away and expect them to be adapted. So why would we do that with bees? So. Uh, you know, fast forward a few, fast forward a couple of years, I guess, and and I happened to attend a uh, uh, a presentation by Dr. Leo Sharashkin uh, at uh, the Kansas Rural Center uh, annual conference. I think it was my first or second conference that I went to, and and I was totally blown away by his presentation on uh, how to keep bees, as he calls it, uh, a, a more natural way, the natural way, uh, if you will. He, he employs a hive that's very, very popular in Europe uh, that's called a lands hive. It's a, it is a horizontal hive. You don't stack supers on it or anything like that, but you can expand their length or you can offer the bees more uh, length if you need to, but they're fairly standard sized. Uh, they're easy to build yourself. And his whole model is based on building small versions of that, maybe a nuke sized version, a six frame version uh, that you can place high up in a tree, and, and not any old tree, but like a sentinel tree along your hedgerow or what have you, and uh, bait it with a little bit of uh, lemongrass oil in a vial that, that leaks the oil just incredibly slowly. So you and I can barely smell it or maybe can't smell it, but it's enough for the bees. And uh, you know, you rub it the inside with pro propolis and put a little beeswax in there and what have you. And uh, what happens in the spring during swarm season is scout bees will find these boxes in the trees and in many cases they'll decide they look like a good place to to bring the new swarm and so uh, we've had uh, really good luck using that uh, technology i think the first year i put seven uh, traps up in the trees and i know for sure six were occupied uh, we even had a couple of colonies o over winter in those boxes because i never got them installed in you know, their permanent hives. Um, so we're really sold on that technology, and every winter now I try to build another five or so uh, hives, and, and this spring we had the, the uh, really sort of, I don't know, awesome experience, if you will, of having a, uh, a feral swarm, not from our bees, but from bees down, you know, a mile away in the creek bed, that actually chose one of the hives that I built over the winter. I baited all of those. Also. 
and uh, and I happened to be sitting out there watching bees while the whole big giant swarm moved in. And uh, you know, you talk about a pretty compelling experience. That's that's more than got me hooked. And so we also manage uh, several you know multi-acre patches to maximize uh, wildflower production throughout the season so that the bees have uh, plenty of local forage to eat and we also discovered this year that they that they can thrive on uh, giant ragweed pollen they they collect it and uh, you know, it's, it's impossible i think to farm in this part of, of uh, kansas and, and not have a giant ragweed patch here or there uh, at any rate so that's another big component of of where we're headed and, and what we do. All of these projects tend to, you know, bring a, a little bit of cash in, sometimes a, lo a more than a little bit of cash in, but, but our real passion is, is managing a diverse landscape. Uh, and we're not so focused on trying to approximate what this landscape was once, but rather just to build a landscape or promote a landscape that that uh, will harbor the largest number of plant and animal species uh, that, you know, really need help in this day and age. Another fun and important aspect of the farm and land management are our chickens, ducks, geese, and guineas. We raise and process our own meat chickens once or twice a year, and we have numerous flocks of laying hens along with a handful of ducks and geese, which are made up of a diverse mix of heritage and a few new breeds that we selected for beautifully colored eggs keen foraging abilities, and winter and summer hardiness. Our birds are truly free range. They come in only at night and only of their own accord. And while we greatly value the impacts this freedom has on our birds and the resulting foods they give us, raising free range birds is not without its challenges. From hard to find egg caches, greater vulnerability to predators both day and night, unique nesting locations, to the occasional mishap with other farm animals, raising free-range poultry definitely keeps us on our toes. On the other hand, the nutritional wisdom that makes its way to the eggs and meat of the birds makes this endeavor worth it to us.